This video is to accompany the Cisco Netacad IT Essentials 7.0 course. This video is Chapter 1, Introduction to the Personal Computer. In Chapter 1, we're going to be looking at personal computers and PC components. 1.1, the personal computer. What is a computer? A computer is a device that allows you to interact with some type of hardware and do some type of calculation or perform some type of function. This is a simple breakdown here of different types of components, components that could make up a computer. Um, what, number one over here could be a scanner, flatbed scanner that you would have here, or um, um, some type of um, device where you take documents and input them into the computer. You might have a central processing unit. You might um, have memory or random access memory. You could have expansion cards, like a video card that could go onto that motherboard. You can have power supplies. You can have an optical disk drive or not. Most newer computers are not coming with optical disk drives, but some um, still have them. You could have some type of storage to device, either a hard disk or an SSD. Your motherboard, which connects all of these components together. Speakers or some type of headphones a monitor, system software, and the system software would be things like your operating system, Windows, Linux, Mac operating system, and then you can also have application software. These are the things that allow you to do some type of function, such as browse the internet, create documents, um, send, send email messages to uh, someone else. Then you have your input devices, uh, keyboard, your mouse, you might have external hard drives, and then you can also have printers. Now, not all of these components will be with every computer, but these are just some of the common uh, components that come with a computer or are defined as being part of a personal computer. One of the things you want to be careful with while working with computers is electrical safety. Electrical devices have certain power requirements, and you can always guarantee that if you're working with an electronic device, a computer, a mobile device, a phone, it's going to have some type of power running to it, either battery powered or some type of another power being plugged into it to operate it. That's why it's called an electrical device or an electronic, because it uses electricity. AC adapters are manufactured for specific laptops, and you want to make sure that you don't swap those out. So you don't want to take one from one brand and put it in a new brand. You always want to make sure, that too, that if you had one laying around, to be very careful about checking to make sure that the, it's the right current and it's the right uh, type of um, model um, or the right type of um, adapter for that model. Exchanging AC adapters with different types of laptops could cause damage to the AC adapter and the laptop, so you want to be careful about that. Some printer parts, such as power supplies, do contain high voltage, and you want to check the printer manual for location of high voltage components, and you want to be very careful about those unless you've been specifically trained to work with those high voltage devices. Uh, power supplies are another example. You do not want to open up power supplies unless you have specific training on doing um, and opening those up and working in there. Um, I very I have very rarely ever opened up a power supply to work on it. And if I have, it's I have allowed it to um, lose its charge over time and make sure that it was decharged properly. So you want to be, be very careful when you're working with um, those types of devices because they can electrocute you and they can prevent fire or they can cause fires, injuries, and fatalities if you're not careful. ESD is another big concern when working with electrical devices. Electrostatic discharge, or ESD, it can occur when there's a buildup of an electrical charge that exists on a surface which comes into contact with another differently charged surface. Now, usually we think about an ESD as in, in the winter time, um, and you're walking across the floor and you go to, gra you go to reach and um, grab the door handle and you get a little zap on your finger and it, and it zaps you. Most of us know that that is an ESD, but what you don't realize is that you can have an ESD and never even know that it occurs. It um, At least 3,000 volts of static electricity must build up before a person can feel ESD, and even just a little bit of ESD can damage a component, you know, just, just a little bit. So you want to be careful that you're properly discharging yourself before you touch electronic components, before you pick up a memory card, before you touch a motherboard, before you touch some type of... Um, computer uh, part. So you want to follow these recommendations. 
You want to keep all components in anti-static bags until they're ready to install. You want to use grounding mats on workbenches or use grounding floor mats in the work areas or use an anti-static wrist strap when working inside computers. Now, some um, overly cautious people will tell you that you need to use all three. I've never used all three in conjunction. I will either use an anti-static wrist strap when I'm working in, in building a computer and I know I'm going to be inside a computer and, and it's going to be tight spaces. I will convert to or I will use a mat on the workbench, which is a grounded mat on the workbench. And I will also make sure that I'm grounding myself properly before I touch anything. 1.2 PC components. The first component we're going to look at is cases. The case houses the internal components such as your power supply, the motherboard, the CPU, the memory, the disk drives, and the assorted adapter cards. The term form factor is something you want to be familiar with. It refers to the physical design and the look of a case. Most common desktop computers are available in form factors including a horizontal case, full-size tower, compact tower, and then all-in-ones. And these are some um, examples down here. This is a horizontal case here. Uh, this is an, obviously an older model. Uh, this is a full-size tower here. This is the most common model that you'll see in most gaming uh, desktops today. You have a compact tower. These are going to be slimline. They're going to be smaller components in there. A lot of times you will see um, that you will have um, laptop type components put into these. So your CD or DVD will be a, a, a laptop type of uh, component in there. And then you have all-in-ones. Uh, these are where the computer and everything is built into the monitor and um, it just comes in one device. It, com call it comes in all in one device. I had an all in one computer, but it was back in the 90s um, and it was all built in together. It was all housed in one case. Power supplies. Uh, a computer has to or needs power and it needs to convert AC or alternating current power into lower voltage DC or direct current power. And that's required by the internal components used by the computer. So a desktop computer power supply form factors include advanced technology or AT that's the original power supply for legacy computer systems now most are coming with AT extended or ATX that's the updated version of the AT you can also have the ATX 12 volt uh, that's the most common power supply on the market today and I misspoke here uh, the ATX 12 volt and then you can have EPS 12 volt that was originally designed for network servers but it is commonly used now in high-end desktop models a power supply includes several different connectors. They're used to power various internal components such as the motherboard and disk drives. Uh, this first image here, this is a modular uh, power supply. You would only plug in and use what you needed. And I will caution you to not use cables or only use the cables that come with that power supply unit. Do not take a cable that, that belongs to one power supply and move it over to another model. Even if it is the same model, um, it could be manufactured at a later time of the year. You want to be super careful that you're using the right cables for the right um, power supply if you're using modular power supplies. And then you have power supplies that they are built in. They do not, um, they come with all the cables or all the um, connectors um, pre-connected and you can't take them off. They're just, um, you have to deal with all of them that are there. You may not use them all. And the ones that are in, unused, you just uh, pin back. But you might have a 20 pin or a 24 pin slotted connector, SATA keyed, Molex, which is the older Molex. Uh, if I can see one on here, and Molex right there. A Berg keyed, a four pin, eight pin, or a six pin PCI Express power connector. So you're going to have different types of power connectors, and it's going to depend on what your motherboard requires and what different device. Uh, the modular ones are more popular. This one's a high end one. This one's 1200. Um, I've got, I think I've got a 700 in mine. Um, in my desktop, or an 800, I can't remember exactly which one, but I've got a Corsair in mine, and it's modular like this, so I only plugged in and used what I needed. The plow power supply voltage, the different connectors in a power supply provide different voltages. The most common voltage are 3.3 volts, 5 volts, and 12 volts. The 3.3 and 5 volt supplies are typically used by digital circuits, while the 12 volt supplies used to run motors and disk drives and fans. So power supplies can also be a single rail, dual rail, or multi-rail. A rail is the printed circuit board, or PCB, inside the power supply to which external cables are connected. 
And one note down here, a computer can tolerate slight fluctuations in power, but a significant deviation can cause the power supply to fail. So you want to be careful about brownouts or blackouts or just losing power altogether. You always want to make sure that you have a good UPS or un uninterruptible power supply on your computer. You spend a lot of money on your computer. You spend a lot of money on the power supply. You've got a lot of, um, a lot of, um, a lot tied up into that computer and your computing device. You want to make sure that you spend a little bit of money and get a, a, a good UPS for it. Motherboards. The motherboard is the backbone of the computer. It ties everything together from the CPU to your expansion cards to your memory. Uh, and then on this one here, the memories, um, your memory slots are here. And then you would have your uh, SSD drives if you put any uh, uh, M2 drives on there. Um, it's a printed circuit board or PCB. It contains buses, electrical pathways that interconnect electronic components. Now, if we flip this image over, you would see them all connected together, but you can look up on the internet and look at the backside of a motherboard and see how they're all tied together on that printed circuit board or on that motherboard. The components could be soldered directly to the motherboard or added using sockets, expansion slots, and ports. Major components on a motherboard include the central processing unit or CPU, and then you have your socket here. Random access memory or RAM, your RAM slots here, your expansion slots, your chipset, your BIOS or your basic input output system. And that's what uh, when you first turn on the power to the computer, it needs some type of system to be able to say, hey, here is everything connected properly. And that's what the BIOS does. Um, you have the, also have the chip and unified extensible firmware interface or the UEFI chip. You also have your SATA connectors and internal USB connector. The motherboard chipset, it is it consists of the integrated circuits on the motherboard that control how the system hardware interacts with the CPU and the motherboard. So most chipsets contain contain or consist of the following two types: Northbridge controls high speed access to the RAM and video card, and Southbridge. That allows the CPU to communicate with slower speed devices, including hard drives, USB ports, and expansion slots. And I will tell you, if you're going to be taking the uh, CompTIA exam, you want to make sure that you're very familiar with these because every time I've taken the exam, I've seen questions about the North Bridge and the South Bridge, and you need to be familiar with those two terms and what they are and what they do. Motherboard form factors. The form factor of a motherboard pertains to the size and shape of the board. There's three common form factors, ATX, micro ATX, and ITX, or Information Tech Extended. And these are the descriptions of each one here. ATX, the most popular form factor. Micro is a little bit smaller. Mini is even smaller, or Mini ITX, and then ITX. Now, the choice of motherboard determines how individual components attach to it the type of power supply required, and the shape of the computer case. So when you are putting a computer together, if you're doing your own build or you're building computers, you want to be very careful that to make sure that the motherboard matches the case, and then you have to build everything around your motherboard. What type of chipset? Motherboards are built for specific chipsets, whether it's an Intel or an AMD. Um, then it would also, uh, what type of uh, power supply you need to come into it, what type of video card is going to be plugged in. So everything is determined off what the motherboard is and what it requires. The CPU, it is responsible for interpreting and executing commands. Think of it kind of as the control of everything. It uh, the, Whether motherboard ties everything together, the CPU is what does the thinking for the computer. It's a small microchip that resides within a CPU package. The CPU socket is the connection between the motherboard and the processor. And modern CPU sockets and processor packages are built in, following our, in the following architectures. Ping, PGA or LGA, pin grid array. The pins are on the underside of the processor package and it's inserted into the motherboard socket. And this is an example of a pin grid array here. The pins are poking out. You wanna be very careful about those pins. If you bend them, you could ruin your chip very easily. And then you have LAN grid array. These pins are in the socket instead of the processor. And here's an example of that. The, the processor lays in on it, and then you have a K, the cover's cut off of this uh, image right here, but then that cover comes down over and locks down, and you take this little handle here and lock it down. This one is you just uh, put your pin in, you, uh, you slide it down into the socket. Cooling systems. The computer components perform better when kept cool. Electronic devices give off heat. When you are working with anything that's electronic, it 
um, and, and I'm not going to get into in this video into to why it does that, but you have electricity being consumed, and in the in that process, it converts some of that energy to heat, and you have to dissipate that heat, or else your computer doesn't perform properly. The computers are kept cool using active and passive cooling solutions. These are two terms that you want to be familiar with. You are going to see those on exams. Active and passive cooling solutions. Active solutions require power, while passive solutions do not. So a passive co passive cooling would be like a heat sink like this. You're going to set this on top of, this, of the CPU down here. Your CPU is going to be down here. And what happens is air, or you might have some type of liquid in there, the air, you take some type of fan and send across this cooling uh, heat sink or like a radiator and it, or just like a radiator on your car and the air passes across these fans or fins and it exchanges heat from down here and takes it up and then exchanges it out. An active cooling would be where you have something turning. So you have uh, some type of fan. Um, you also have combinations. This is a water cool. This is an example of a water cooled here. So you're going to have water or some type of liquid cooling. Not, maybe it's not necessarily water, but some type of liquid cooling. And the fan sends air just much like you would have on a car radiator. But it would send air across this radiator here and the fluid gets exchanged. And this sets on top of the CPU. And so that fluid gets exchanged in and out as it heats up the uh, pump. There's a small pump and it pumps the fluid in and out and exchanges the heat in and out. A case fan is considered an active cooling. A heat sink is considered passive cooling. Different types of memory for a computer. Uh, there's going to be different types of memory chips depending upon which type of computing device you have. Uh, this is an example of uh, computer memory uh, for a laptop device. Uh, this would be a, for a desktop here, and these are some older, much, much older uh, examples of RAM. Um, I've worked probably with most of those uh, throughout with my time in computers. Uh, memory chips, though, are, they store data in the forms of bytes. A byte is a block of 8 bits stored as either a 1 or a 0. And you want to make sure that you know what a byte is and that 8 bits, 8 bits, a bit is a 1 or a 0. A bit is a 1 or a 0. And 8 bits is a byte, B-Y-T-E. Now you have read-only memory, or ROM, that's a ROM chip, that's read-only memory. Those are pre-programmed chips that are usually soldered or permanently attached to like a motherboard or the, to the device. They're not removed. And then you can have random access memory, and that's temporary working storage for data and programs that are being accessed by the CPU. And it's what we consider volatile memory, and that's an important term you need to know. Volatile memory means that if you turn the power off to the device, you lose what was ever in, what was in random access memory. It's volatile. It's not long-term storage. Adding more RAM in a computer enhances the system performance. However, the maximum amount of RAM that can be installed is limited by the motherboard. Again, we come back to what does the motherboard allow for? Um, is it you know is it 16 gigabits of RAM? Is it 32? Is it 64? Is it 128? Um, so when you are checking when you're buying purchasing all of your components, you want to make sure that the type of RAM is going to fit that motherboard. Types of ROM or read-only memory, you can have ROM chips, PROM chips, EEPROM chips, or EEPROM chips, and these are some examples down here. These would be pre-programmed chips that are put onto the device that have information that needs to be uh, read. Now, different types of RAM or random access memory, you have dynamic RAM or DRAM and static RAM or SRAM. And then you have synchronous dynamic RAM, or SDRAM. You have double data rate synchronous dynamic RAM. <laughs> Sounds almost like a comic comic at some time when you start reading some of these off. And then you have DDR2, DDR3, uh, DDR4, and then GDDR, GDDR, synchronous dynamic RAM. Um, I think I've got DDR4 in mine, my current one, my current computer. Memory modules. Memory chips are sold, soldered soldered to a circuit board to create a memory module, which is placed into a memory slot on the motherboard. Different types of memory modules include DIP, SIM, DIM, or SODIM. And the speed of memory has a direct impact on how much data a processor can process in a given period of time. The fastest memory is typically static RAM or SRAM, and it's used as cache memory. The three most common types of cache memory are L1 cache, 
it's integrated into the CPU. L2 cache, it was originally mounted on the motherboard, but it's now integrated into the CPU. And then you have L3 cache, and that's used by some high-end workstations and server CPUs. Memory errors occur when the data is not stored correctly in the memory chips. The computer uses different methods to detect and correct data errors in memory. The different types are non-parity. Non-parity memory does not check errors. Parity memory contains 8 bits for data and 1 bit for error checking. And ECC, or error correction code memory, can detect multiple bit errors in memory and correct single bit errors in memory. Adapter cards can increase the functionality of a computer by adding controllers uh, for different types of devices. Uh, some popular ones now, sound, sound adapters in... To, um, most modern computers, sound adapters are built into the motherboard. Uh, back when I built computers back in the 90s, um, 80s and well, first started in the late 80s, uh, sound adapters or sound cards were separate and you would have something that would look like this that would plug in. Your network interface card, most computers are going to have the NIC built in on the motherboard, but some computers that you may work with will not, and it will look something like this that will plug in. A wireless NIC card, a video adapter or display adapter known as a video card and if you know anything about computers or work anything about computers in, in the 2021 2020 time frame uh, GPUs uh, graphic processing units or graphic cards are very expensive um, they are most of them are some type of uh, gonna have some type of fan on them and then you're gonna plug those in on the motherboard uh, you might have a capture card a TV tuner a USB controller card, or you can add more uh, USB devices in, or an eSATA card. Computers have expansion slots on the motherboard to install the adapter cards. So you would have something that would look like these that you would plug those in, and I'm going to go back to the previous screen. So these right here are going to be little gold-plated slots that you plug into the adapter card slots. And the type of adapter card connector must match the expansion slot. It's got to match. Otherwise, it's not going to work properly. Uh, but some common ones are peripheral component. I can't say that properly. Peripheral component interconnect or PCI, mini PCI, PCI extended or PCI X, PCI Express or PCI E, a riser card or an accelerated graphics port or AGP. We have types of storage devices. Data drives provide non-volatile storage of data. Now, non-volatile, that's another, you want to make sure that you know the difference between volatile and non-volatile. Non-volatile means if you turn the power off to the computer or turn the device off, your information is still retained, and that is considered non-volatile. Some drives have fixed media. Other drives have removable media. So a, an optical drive is considered non-volatile because you would write your data to that uh, CD or DVD and it could be long-term storage for you. You can have a hard disk drive, which has a spinning platter, a solid state drive, which has no spinning drive in it, or you might have some type of magnetic tape drive, which aren't used a lot anymore, but they are still in use today. Data storage devices can be classified according to the media, magnetic, like hard disk drive and a tape drive. So you might have a hard disk drive that's magnetic. This is magnetic. Solid state that uses a, an internal a computer component to uh, use a solid state uh, technology or optical like a CD or DVD. Now the storage device interfaces, uh, that's inside a computer. Uh, you can use Serial AT, Serial AT or SATA. The legacy interface is Parallel AT or what we always called EIDE or it used to be IDE and then they had uh, EI, EIDE. The standards define the way the data is transferred, the transfer rates, and physical characteristics of the cables and connectors. There's three main versions of the SATA, SATA. You have SATA 1, SATA 2, and SATA 3. The cables and connectors are the same, but the data transfer speeds are different. And this chart down here at the bottom shows you the different speed differences between IDE, EIDE. So we went from 8.3 megabytes a second all the way up to 6 gigabytes per second from IDE all the way to SATA 3. Now, magnetic media storage, it represents binary values as magnetic, magnetized or non-magnetized physical areas of the magnetic media. What happens is this little drive head right here moves across the platter and it sends a little electrical charge and it turns those um, physical areas of the magnetic media, it will turn them up and down 
And so when it, when it goes back to read, it know, if it's a turned off or on, depending upon the physical um, physical area, so it's physically turning magnetic areas using magnets off and on on that platter. You can have a hard disk drive or HDD. That's the traditional magnetic disk drive with storage capacity ranging from gigabytes to terabytes. You can also ha come across tape drives. Those are most often used for archiving data. Uh, they use a magnetic read and write head and removable tape cartridge. They're very similar to the older VHS style uh, storage back from the 80s and 90s. And then common tape storage capacities vary between a few gigabytes to terabytes. Now, semiconductor storage or solid state drives or SSDs, they store data as electrical charges in a semiconductor flash memory. That, may, that does make SSDs a lot faster than magnet, magnetic HH, H hard disk drives. SSDs have no moving parts. They make no noise. They're more energy efficient, and they pr produce much less heat than hard drives. So you used to, early on, you would see SSDs in laptops because you didn't have to power them. You didn't have to cool them as, as much, and they were smaller form factors. Now you have the disk drive form factor. That's similar to a hard disk drive. that would be something like this right here. You have expansion cards that plugs directly into the motherboard and mounts into the computer case like other expansion cards. This is an adapter card right here that you would plug in. It's got it on the little board. Or you might have an M2 drive. This is an SSD M2 drive. Uh, M SATA or M2 modules, these packages can use a special socket. M2 is the standard for computer expansion cards. The Non-Volatile Memory Express or NVMe was developed specifically to allow computers to take better advantage of the features of SSDs by providing a standard interface between SSDs and the PCIe bus. NVMe allows compliant SSD drives to attach to the PCIe bus without requiring special drivers. And then solid state hybrid drives are comprised between the magnetic hard disk drive and an SSD. They're faster than a hard disk drive, but less expensive. They combine a magnetic hard disk drive with an onboard flash memory serving as a non-volatile cache. Now, and what you might see, and I'm going to back up here. So you might have this hard drive here, and what they will do is they'll have the case. That's a three and a half, but you, uh, but you would have this three and a half drive here, and then on the motherboard or on the board of this, you would put an SSD drive in here. So you could use part of that as memory, and so it could offload some of that uh, request for data onto the SSD drive, so it can process faster. Types of optical storage devices. Optical drives are removable media storage devices that use lasers to read and write data onto an optical media, like a DVD or a CD. There's three different types. You have compact disc, digital versatile disc, DVD, or Blu-ray disc, or BD, and that's high def digital video data. CD, DVD, and BD can be pre-recorded, read only, recordable, write once, or re-recordable, read, write, and read and write multiple times to it. DVD and Blu-ray, or BD media, can also be single layer or dual layer. Dual layer roughly doubles the capacity of a single disc. And down here on this chart, you'll see some of the um, storage capacity. CD-ROMs could hold about 700 meg megabytes. DVDs could hold anywhere from 4.7 to 8.5 gigabytes. And Blu-ray can hold um, on a single layer 25 gigabytes up to 50 gigabytes for a dual layer. Video ports and cables. A video port connects a monitor to a computer using a cable. Video ports and monitor cables transfer analog signals, digital signals, or both. So video ports and cables include digital visual interface DVI. And just a note here, you are going to need, if you're going to on this on the exam for this course and for the CompTIA A plus exam uh, exams. Um, depending on which one it is, you're going to need to know these different types of cables and video ports. Uh, DVI, DisplayPort, HDMI, Thunderbolt 1 or 2, Thunderbolt 3, VGA, or RCA. In RCA, you're not going to see a lot. That's usually, that's just audio. Uh, you would have the uh, video coming through the yellow and audio coming through the red and white. VGA, Thunderbolt, DisplayPort. DVI and HDMI. Other ports and cables, input and output ports on a computer connect peripheral devices such as printers, scanners, and portable drives. You might have a PS2 and this, but you may never see one of these. This is an older one. These goes back to the 90s and 2000s. This was a PS2 for your keyboard and mouse. You would have audio and game ports. 
for your um, and and you still see these on computers today. So you can plug in your speakers, plug in your headphones, plug in um, uh, a joystick, maybe your network port, serial or SATA ports, integrated dev- drive electronics or IDE and USB adapters and converters. There are connection standards in use today. The components are called adapters and converters. You can convert that performs the same function as an adapter, but it also translates the signal from one technology to the other. An adapter physically connects one technology to another. So you might have a DVI to a VGA. I use these quite commonly in my work uh, where we would have a DVI on the motherboard or out of the video card, but the monitor is still VGA. Or you might have a USB to Ethernet. I don't see too much of the USB to PS2s anymore. DVI to HDMI, I've used these frequently. Molex to SATA, HDMI to VGA. Now, when we're talking about input devices, input devices um, allow the user to communicate with the computer. Some of the first input devices included keyboard to mouse. Those are two of the most common used input devices still in use today. A flatbed scanner would be an input device, you know, image documents. Joysticks and game pads were input devices. Um, you might have a keyboard um, video uh, monitor uh, switch, um, keyboard monitor mouse. I say monitor, keyboard video monitor. It's it's keyboard keyboard monitor and mouse switch, which allows you to use multiple, uh, one monitor, one keyboard, and one mouse for multiple devices. You typically see that in some type of server rack. Some of the new input devices that we are using in modern time is touch screen, a stylus, a little pen that you would uh, you know t- touch to your screen, a magnetic strip reader, or a barcode scanner. That's those are also input devices. Just think of an input device. Any t- the, the way I remember an input device is anytime you are providing data to the computer, into the computer, it's an input device. You might have a digital camera. You're taking data and putting it into a device. Webcams, signature pads, smart card readers, microphones. Those are all input devices. NFC devices and terminals are near-field communication facial recognition scanners, fingerprint scanners, voice recognition scanners, and VR reality headsets are also considered input devices. Output devices, think of output devices as any time the computing device sends information to a user, it's it's considered an output device. So a VR headset, virtual reality headset, a printer, a projector, speakers, headphones, a monitor. Now a monitor, if it's a touchscreen monitor, is going to be dual capability. It's going to be an input and an output device. Monitors and projectors, you have LCD or liquid crystal display, LED, light emitting diode, and organic LED or OLED. Now most video projectors use LCD or DLP technology. The DLP stands for digital light processing. And different projectors have different numbers of lumens. And that's how bright they're going to be. That affects the level of brightness and the projected image. VR and AR headsets, there is a difference. Virtual reality uses computer technology technology to create a simulated three-dimensional environment. A VR headset completely encases the upper portion of the user's face, not allowing any ambient light from their surroundings. An augmented reality uses similar technology, but it superimposes images and audio over the real world in real time. And this would might be an example here where you can still see out, but you're also going to have images projected in front of you. Printers and output devices that create hard copies of files. A hard copy might be on a sheet of paper, can also be on a plastic form created from a 3D printer. Uh, You can use a printer to, you know, do a 3D printing. You can print credit cards or, you know, not that you're going to be printing credit cards, but you can print cards or ID cards. Uh, You can, uh, the older impact printers, not many of those are around, but there are some still. Uh, You may see some of these in the workplace. Uh, You have inkjet, impact, thermal, laser, and 3D printers. You will need to know these different types of printers. uh, If you, on, on, in this course and on the CompTIA A plus exam, printers use wired or wireless connections. Printers require some type of printing that do require printing material like ink, toner, liquid, or plastic for a 3D printer, but you are going to have to take that into consideration as there's some type of material that needs to be used to print something out. And printers also use drivers to communicate with the operating system. Speakers and headphones. Speakers are a type of auditory output device that's uh, just for the surrounding area. And headphones are some t- either like an earbud or an earphone that's over the ear or in the ear. Um, and those... Uh, 
either projected wirelessly or wired.